Good um, afternoon, good evening. Uh, this is uh, Sasha Ivanovich from uh, Los Angeles, California. And um, today uh, we are uh, together in an online virtual meeting, which we're calling here at the Guide Institute a one-on-one -on -one discussion with an expert. And today's topic is, I think, a topic which all of us are always interested in because it um, is in most of our offices a normal topic, which is implant prostodontics. So we will talk more about non-surgical work. We'll be talking really more about the steps to be successful and to be consistent with um, clinical work on top of the implants. And of course, there's a lot of details like biology, there's a lot of details like clinical, there's a, a lot of details about biomaterials, there's a lot of details about patient selection and patient treatment. And so we need really like an, um, a top expert in this field to discuss this with us. So we have invited today uh, Dr. Giacomo Fabri. Giacomo, hello. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Sasha, for inviting me. It's our pleasure, Giacomo. And Giacomo is uh, from Italy, from Cattolica. And uh, he's one of the uh, front pioneers and innovators in the field of implant prosthodontics today. Um, he has a lot of different uh, backgrounds in his information. He has published scientific articles. He has been with, let's say, the best prosthodontist in Italy, like we had Mauro Fradiani last week here. And uh, he is also, of course, uh, now worldwide lecturing on the experience you have in this field. And he also works with corporate companies to improve the biomaterials that we're using today for implants. So Giacomo, it's our pleasure. Thank you, Sasha, for the nice introduction. The pleasure is mine, really. And, and honestly, for me, it's always great to have the opportunity to share knowledge and experience with the surgical aspects, with surgeons because you think that is the most important thing in order to achieve a excellent therapy in implant therapies, in implant dentistry, right? Really often when we speak about the implants, we just speak about the surgical aspect, but they think that prosto and surgeon are, they have the same goal, the same target, and so they have to work together really, really strictly and in a really nice way. So this is really a great opportunity and a great uh, uh, idea to organize this kind of event. I, I agree with you, Giacomo. Um, to be also available for us for any questions or any discussions, we have invited as a special guest, uh, nobody else than our dear colleague and friend who we work with a lot. And Giacomo does a lot of uh, collaboration with Dr. Francesco Micioni. Francesco, hello. Hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure also for me to be here with you and have the opportunity to discuss about these interesting topics. And uh, Francesco has a similar uh, CV background like Giacomo. He has worked and trained with some of the best mentors in prosthodontics like Mauro Fradiani. And uh, he has also like published in our scientific journals. And he also has an active teaching and speaking engagement around the world to explain, you know, the details that we have. Uh, the interesting part about Francesco is also that before he started to be a dentist, he actually was a laboratory technician. And so he knows all the details about how technical uh, attention to, you know, really perfection is important in prosthodontics and especially in implant prosthodontics. So that will definitely also help us maybe in the discussion. 
That's good. So I welcome, will be there. Welcome, Francesco. Thank you. Ciao, okay. Francesco. So we have uh, maybe like an, uh, an open discussion first between uh, Giacomo and uh, myself. And then, uh, you know, we can move around to uh, um, ask Francesco or he can come in. And then, of course, also we have the chat from our audience. Um, first, just to the audience, I hope that everybody is safe. Some of you we have seen already virtually on some of our guide meetings. So um, we've been in touch over the last weeks and months. Good to see you again. And for those of you who are new, there's a lot of, uh, of course, virtual uh, information that you can find now on guide because unfortunately, you know, we can't have our training sessions anymore at this moment because of the COVID-19. Uh, the classrooms are still um, a lot under uh, scrutiny. Symposia are still being canceled. For example, a few days ago, I received information from the American Academy of Periodontology, um, and I was supposed to speak there. And it was uh, um, going to be held in Hawaii, Honolulu, which of course everybody's looking forward to, to get together uh, with colleagues and friends and they just canceled it. And this meeting was in, uh, supposed to be held in October or November. So uh, we're still receiving cancellations from symposia for the rest of the year. So uh, I don't know how long we will have to stay like this uh, in a distance, but until it happens, I'm really glad that we have this virtual platform at Guide so we can at least uh, share information and knowledge. So Giacomo. Yeah. Um, no, I know that you have been very involved with implant prosthodontics and, uh, of course, like, I'm just going to ask you a very, I would say, uh, direct question, but also simple question is when you look at the early days of your implant prosthodontics, when like, you know, you were just starting off, maybe restoring some implants and working with implants. What do you see like, you know, is the biggest change for you when you look at all the new materials nowadays that we're dealing with, also all the ceramic materials, the zirconia materials, et cetera. So what's the biggest change that you have seen over the years that you have been in practice with implant prosthodontics? Yeah, thank you, Sasha, for this question. I think that is really an important topic. It's an important to topic that uh, uh, should be also shared with the dental technician. Because of course, uh, uh, the new materials, and in particular the zirconia and implant uh, prosthodontis, really has revolutionized our prosthetic approach, in particular in the lab. Because uh, the possibility for the dental technician to use the CAD CAM technology really has simplified dramatically all the clinical procedure and the cost and many, many aspects. In my, in my routine nowadays, I use 100% zirconia restorations in the anterior and the posterior segments. Zirconia, I think that uh, can give us many benefits. Many people think that zirconia is good just for aesthetic reason, but zirconia really can give us many, many advantages like also the biological advantages. Zirconia is really a great biocompatible material. On the zirconia, we can have really a great soft tissue adherence. We can uh, create really good seal, a good MOOC integration like with the titanium. And so really, from also from the biological point of view, really we can have amazing benefits. Of course, you know that patients uh, uh, don't like to see any kind of uh, gray, any kind of dark color, any kind of discoloration. And so the possibility to work with the zirconia can also give us the possibility to create restorations that can be really safe and predictable in the long term, because also in case of a small recession, never the patient could see uh, discoloration or gray transmitted through the soft tissue, uh, through the coping. So really many, many benefits. While we are on this topic, I think that it's really important to point out how when we speak about zirconia, it's important uh, to point out many, many aspects. For example, 
the zirconia that I should maintain in the submucosal area, sub in the subgingival area, should be just zirconia, hand-polished zirconia, without any kind of ceramic, without any kind of stains, because of course it's the, the zirconia that is biocompatible. It's not the stains of the phosphatic ceramics that you can layer on the top of it. Then, in the uh, extra gingival portion, of course, we can use zirconia monolithic using stains, using also phosphatic porcelain. But it's really important, in my opinion, to divide the restoration rooms in two parts, the sub, uh, subgingival area and the, the extra gingival area. And the, they are two different words, totally different. The protocol are different because uh, Sub, in the subgingival area, really, we want to achieve a good soft tissue adhesion. So it's important to use just zirconia. And for example, also, the treatment of the surfaces is different. For example, in the deepest portion, so in the area that will be located exactly on the top of the implant, I like to have a surfaces that is not really super smooth. It's not like mirror-like because I want to have a minimal roughness in order to have a good soft tissue adherence. While at the level of the sulcus, I like to have really a super smooth surfaces, like mirror-like, like a mirror, in order to reduce as much as possible the plaque accumulation. So really, it's, it seems simple to speak about zirconia, no? Okay, zirconia, okay, that's it, no? Zirconia should be evaluated in each part of the restorations. Okay. And of course, it is a, a big topic. Uh, Giacomo, that's, that's um, important biologically and uh, important clinically. But now, of course, um, if you incorporate that into your clinical practice, as you said earlier, you need a laboratory technician to execute this in detail. Mm -hmm. So how do, how do we... Um, communicate this part of prostodontics uh, and also like the connection to the uh, body because like of course you're connecting now a zirconia uh, material to the body and the implant uh, as well how do you talk to the laboratory technician so he understands you and and me and everybody yeah of course this kind of aspect depends also on uh, the implant system that we use because you know that uh, uh, each implant system uh, have its specific prosthetic components each cut cam technology has its specific uh, procedures but considering your question about how i connect the zirconia to the implant of course we have many options we have some system that can produce a manufact that can be screwed directly to the implants, or they can screw directly on intermediate abutment. Really often we use a titanium base abutment, so-called universal base abutment, that can be cemented on the zirconia manufact and then can be screwed on the top of the implant, of course. But Always, we, li we like to work with the screw retain approach for many reasons. You know that we can avoid the excess of cement. We can uh, have uh, an easy retrievability if you want to remove it. If we have a screw retain approach, it's much easier, it's much better. And uh, so I think that uh, it's easy really to manage the zirconia today. It's really easy. Maybe in the beginning, 10 years ago, it was more complicated than now. But now all the company, all the cut cam technology have many options. But um, I understand this part, uh, Giacomo, but uh, as you know, to discuss with technicians is not so easy. So mm -hmm. if you want no ceramics or no glazing subgingivally, you know that like a lot of technicians will, because they think it's of course better for aesthetics, do something subgingival. So how do you recommend me to talk to my technician? Do I have to like discuss this with every single technician or I have to send my, uh, my case to your technician? How do I do that? <laughs> I understand your point because honestly, I, I, I took three years 
to convince my dental technician to don't layer ceramics in the subgingival portion. So it's really, you're right, it's difficult to communicate with dental technician to convince them. I think that the most important thing in this communication is to try to explain to the dental technician why you don't want felspatic porcelain subgingivally. In mm -hmm. that way, you can really realize the reason why you don't want it. And so you can really understand why you want as just a polished zirconia subgingival. And then finally, it could start to do it. Otherwise, I got your point. You ask to no stain, no phosphatic. And then when you receive the manufacture, always right. you can find some stains in that, that area. Right. Hey guys, may I add something just to, uh, I think it's really important that first of all, uh, we have to trust about the technician, but for sure it's the team approach. So it's really important every single time we discuss cases, uh, how to, for example, do prosto on implant, there is the, the need for the clinician to sit and speak with the, te uh, with the technician why we do something. Uh, and then they have to understand the biology as well. So we have to discuss a little bit in the way to create this kind of field, this kind of environment that also the technician that understand why you have to avoid something. Also the emergence profile, I remember that in the beginning of the CAT CAM, they were using a button that were uh, flaring out like this. And this was completely a disaster for our, for our example, nice cases after a GBR, you were coming out with something like this and was destroying our job. So yeah. for sure, we have to understand first the rule and then speak and then explain to the technician. And then for sure, the greatest part is uh, to collaborate uh, with technician in a strict way and have more or less always the same for some type of treatment. Yeah, I totally this agree. I totally agree. In, te in terms of the morphology, I think that a good way to communicate with a dental technician is always to work and to play with a temporary restoration. No, Francesco? In that way, you can test in the mouth and then you can transfer the morphology to the lab and the, the, the lab can transform the temporary to the final. In, yeah, yeah, sure. Terms, in terms of technical approach and all the, the procedures step by step, I totally agree with you. It's important that the dental technician uh, knows why you ask him this kind of thing. In that way, for sure, he, we can do it. Okay. Well, I mean, it's um, easier, I think, discussed than actually done. And what I just uh, heard from you, Giacomo, I think that was the most important part for me, is when you said that it took you three years to convince your technician. And I think that's, I think, a really key moment in this discussion about uh, doing this is that, like, for those of us who are working with, uh, you know, technician and laboratories, it's, of course, easy to say the ideal, but it's not so easy to do it, actually. So um, each of us have to find, you know, a technician or a laboratory that we trust. And then, uh, based on, uh, from Francesco's input, is then we have to uh, really like uh, spend time with the, the technician or with uh, the laboratory that they understand what the new biological parameters are. Now, I can move the discussion to a little bit different one. Um, is like, for example, um, there are of course small abutments, titanium abutments, which take the connection of these zirconia frameworks uh, away from the implant and the implant bone level uh, and which also can control of course a little bit the trauma that Francesco was talking about. So we have a protocol as you know which is called the one abutment one time protocol and uh, Giacomo you have worked with this here over the last few years. Yeah. What is your um, you know what are your what is maybe like your I know that you believe in it I know that you like it <laughs> and that you do it, but what is your uh, connection today um, in your practice? Is it still the same or have you changed some protocol? In, today, my practice really, I, I try always uh, to work in one abutment one time, always. Because uh, you, I was starting to use it uh, three, four years ago. 
And to be honest with you, year after year, I can see and realize better and better the benefit that I have using this kind of technique. And it's a benefit, the benefits are for me, the benefits are for the patients, the benefits are also for the dental technician, you know. Uh, we spoke five minutes ago about protocol and it's difficult to transfer the protocol to the dental technician. But if the dental technician work not at the implant level, but if the dental technician works at the abutment level, of course, his procedures are not so relevant. So we can always in that way reduce the complication the risk that the dental technician can create and produce for our implant and for our restorations because his job, his rehabilitation, his work, his manufacture, his crown will be located at the sub-tissue level because the deepest portion, of course, will be, be, will be always occupied by the abutment and never removed. And honestly, I think that in the future, in the future, maybe in the next 10 or 15 years, in my opinion, all the company will produce a system that uh, will consider only prosthetic approach in one abutment one time. I strongly believe in it. That's, that's, I think that's a very uh, extreme position you're taking, which I think is good. <laughs> so you really believe in your point. And, uh, and me personally, being more on the surgical side of implant prosthodontics, I also believe in it because um, I have seen so many times when I um, refer my patients back to non-surgical dentists, how problems occur because of poor connections of uh, materials to implants, um, problems with emergence profile, uh, problems with materials selected. So I think that like by building in like a tissue level type of component, you are eliminating one step. Now, give me, uh, Giacomo, um, you know, there's, there's of course an abutment that both you and I w use, and that's the one abutment, one time protocol from uh, Nobel called On One. Um, for me, the problem is sometimes that the abutment is a little bit too big. So the emergence profile is too wide. Are you using this abutment more in the posterior uh, segments of the, uh, for the patient treatment or also for the anterior? And how is your success in, in the anterior? Yeah, I totally agree with you. Actually, the abutment that you mentioned is really good in the posterior segments, molar and premolar but it's not good in the anterior segment because it flare outs too much and, uh, and, and too fast. So it's too wide really, because we know that with the regular platform implants, we have a diameter that is 5.3 and for narrow platform is 4.8. So really it's too wide if you want to manage the static areas. And in my opinion, with this kind of abutment, we still have many limitations from the prosthetic point of view because we don't have the chance to work on this platform with the CAD CAM technology, but we have the chance to work only with prefabricated abutments, titanium abutments. And so we know that, that when we are in the static areas, we love to work with zirconia abutments, but at the moment we don't have zirconia abutment or this kind of on-one system. So many limitations, I totally agree with you, but anyway, in the posterior segments, it's, uh, in my practice, is the go-to solution, is the routine. And uh, I'm really thrilled, I'm happy, because I'm sure that in the future, the company is going to introduce a sort of uh, on-one concept also for the anterior segments, uh, with new morphologies, with new diameters, uh, new biomechanics uh, features that can really improve the outcome. Okay. Is the other companies, have they followed a little bit? Have you seen other companies do something similar? Yeah, yeah. There is other company that uh, already have done something similar and also better maybe because they introduce uh, abutments that are slimmer and so they can preserve much better the tissue, the bone, and uh, in my opinion, can be managed also in the aesthetic area. 
So many companies, they're starting to work on it. Which, which, uh, which one are you referring to? Is a MIS, I think, that uh, has introduced a good, uh, a good uh, intermediate right. final abutment. So, I mean, we're expecting basically that if you think about that, you and maybe I and others are really looking at this um, one abutment one time. Of course, then, as you say, we're expecting probably all companies to have something similar. Uh, and of course, they're going to be trying to push each other to have the best, uh, best yeah, uh, yeah. material. Yeah, exactly. And, okay. and now, and now we, we can, uh, the, you, to win the game, uh, it's important to don't think simply in terms of morphologies and sides. Now there is another character and the character is the surfaces, the energy, the chemistry in the surfaces, because you know, these products are produced with an, an industrialized process. So we receive them with an amazing quality, with an amazing hydrophilic properties. And so also this aspect really can play an important role in terms of some tissue adhesion, you know, because wettability, hydrophilic properties can really uh, work like uh, uh, cell uh, adhesion, can cold cells in the sites, and so they can improve the cell adhesion to the surfaces. We are working on it recently with some uh, studies and really the, the, the result is really good, it's incredible. And it, it, you have really clinical significant difference between traditional abutment or the new one. And is this only for titanium that you're talking about, the surface roughness changes or also for zirconia? No, it is just for titanium for the moment. Okay. Only titanium. Because I, I noticed that before you were talking about surface roughness on zirconia, um, you know, just above the bone level or above the implant level. Yeah. Uh, and then you wanted to have it more like a mirror in the sulcus. So how do you uh, increase the surface roughness on zirconia then uh, above the bone? Because we, we, my dental technician normally use two different rubber drills. We, I am in, in the most deepest portion, you, you use a, a rubber drill that can create a roughness of, of about 0 0.2, 0 0.3 microns. And then we use another one in the most coronal aspect and we can create a really a mirror-like surfaces in order to reduce the plaque accumulation as much as possible. But in the deepest portion, when I have the junctional epithelium and we have also a midesmosome, I want just a minimal roughness in order to improve the adherence of the cells on these surfaces. And, and if I understand you correctly, you're talking about this as an, a laboratory technical driven procedure. Exactly, exactly. But then you, you still have to, so and you said 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 millimeters? No, no, the microns, 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 the reference, yeah. And, um, but then you still have a problem with the, the, the cleanliness, like, you know, how do you clean a laboratory produced um, micron roughened surface. Yeah, I know it's, it's really, it's not easy to produce them. And then there's the problem that you have to clean them because every single time that you use rubber drill, you have the risk to contaminate the surfaces with, uh, with rubber, with some uh, material that comes from the drill, of course. And this is the most defect, the most drawbacks when we use with the custom, when we, when we use customized abutment, because when we work with customized abutment, never we will have a surfaces that is really, really a totally sub tissue friendly. Because you know, you can also use a really strong uh, uh, options to clean and decontaminate. But when you work with this kind of material to do decontaminate the abutment, you have the risk to create a surfaces that is not so tissue friendly. So it's decontaminated, it's sterilized, but it's aggressive with the soft tissues with the cells. So it means that even if it's a totally decontaminated the surfaces, cannot achieve a good cell adhesion and proliferation. So it's really a, a, an important topic that today is still uh, need more uh, study, more uh, research, of course. 
And it's also one reason why I love the one abutment one time, because when I work with one abutment at one time, I receive an abutment that is perfectly clean, sterilized, and so I go in the mouth really straight without any kind of problem. Okay, maybe I can pull in Francesco here, because um, Francesco, yeah. I know that you know the laboratory part very well. How do we control this like um, uh, subgingival space to, to keep something when you oh. have a, a, a cat, no, like a, um, a zirconia framework or a zirconia abutment, how do we keep it clean? Um, it's very important for me, me being a biologist and a clinician, uh, to control this. Okay, as it was explaining Giacomo before, it's uh, for sure for us it's important in the gingival area, especially when uh, we put zirconia and this zirconia must be really polished it really well. We have rubber wheels that can do a really good job. And then for the, the contamination, it's interesting that uh, there are a couple of articles that describe the surface, okay, at the end of this kind of procedure. And uh, exactly as I was explaining, Giacomo, it's interesting to see that uh, even if you, uh, you clean in a really good way, you never obtain the same uh, 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 surface that they can obtain uh, with uh, the abutment that they come directly from the company. So it means that some remains of the, the rubber wheels or other type of uh, uh, con, uh, contaminants can remain on the, sur on the surface. So the best is for what uh, uh, every single time we have to, to deliver crowns that they have a smooth uh, gingival margin, what I saw uh, um, that it's uh, uh, soap and also the steam can together create uh, the best. I try also to find uh, uh, a solution that was recommended in an article in the way to clean in the ultrasonic bath. But uh, there were like proteinase uh, or other type of, um, uh, uh, of uh, liquid uh, to add, but it's almost impossible uh, to follow the, the receipt that was found uh, on the article. So I try uh, collecting this type of stuff, but was almost impossible. So yeah. at the end for me, brushing really well with soap and then with the steam, you can probably clean as much as possible the surface and then never put uh, the restoration again on the cast. So normally I ask her to the lab to put in a little bag, the, the bag that we use normally to seal the instrument, okay? In the way to arrive to me already clean and perfect. Much more, I, I avoid the, to, to go with the hands and touching everything uh, before to place my restoration in the mouth. This is more or less what I normally do. But I agree completely with Giacomo that the best surface that we can obtain is this, uh, the surface that, that is given by the company, that it's uh, perfectly clean and without any contaminants on the surface. And there are really nice article describing uh, this yeah. with uh, looking with microscope. Yeah, yeah, okay. there are many articles about this. What I want just to add something that I do is guys, exactly what uh, Francesco has uh, said, but what I ask to my dental technician, and this is easy and each dental technician can understand, is that when you have finished the restorations, please take the restoration and put it in a small box with uh, a solution that is 50% chlorhexidine and 50% alcohol. And I asked my dental technician to maintain my restoration there. So in that way, the restoration will stay in this solution for at least one or two days. And in that way, the solution can make the effect for a lot of hours. It's not like when we receive the restoration in the clinic, we take it out from the, from the paper or from the model and we put with the restorations in the chlorhexidine like in the cappuccino eh? and, and then we go in the mouth. In that way it can stay in the solution for many, many hours. So it's much better than to keep them on the models or in another box without the solution. Why not to do it? Yeah, but is this a scientific evaluated method or this is a Giacomo Fabri uh, preferred method? Is Giacomo Fabri preferred method? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Be because alcohol, alcohol can clean really well, but is really aggressive, and so to compensate, to balance it, I decided to use some chlorhexidine. Okay. And I, honestly, I think that I, I should do some specific evalu specific evaluations, more scientific one. 
but it is exactly what they do and they tell you really honestly. Okay, uh, thank you, Giacomo. I think this is very important. So let's uh, switch the topic a little bit, but like I think a uh, very clear discussion here about uh, abutments um, and you can see here that there is still like a, a lot of lack of understanding of how actually we take these frameworks and abutments from a technician and we treat them as a sterile stock abutment. And uh, it's, it's for me actually as a scientist for many years, it's like um, very interesting that there is so little um, information and knowledge available uh, in this area. So I'm sure that over the next uh, few years, uh, there's going to be a lot of people going to be looking at this because as we're discussing it now, more and more people are going to look at the scientific evidence. So uh, I look forward to that. Correct. So um, give us a little bit your, um, you know, your discussion about, um, um, you know, when you do your rehabilitation, there's always like, this question of uh, myself surgically to um, regenerate the bone to the best possible level and then have natural gingival margins. And then there's of course the restorative aspect uh, which says like, you know what, I can probably manage this case with pink porcelain and I need less surgery. So you are an, uh, of course an excellent prosthodontist. You know what excellent surgeons can do and now you have a patient uh, who is there in your, in your practice who obviously needs some kind of uh, horizontal and vertical augmentation, but you also know that in that same patient, you could maybe do pink porcelain and uh, have a good result as well. So at what point do you prefer pink porcelain in a patient uh, over a surgical augmentation? Yeah, it's really, really a good point. Um, honestly, I think that is the patient that can make the difference in this decision-making process. Uh, and honestly, when I have to take this decision, I like always to share this decision with the patient too. And always I try to guide the patient in my favorite option. For example, if I have a patient that's uh, with a bad oral hygiene, if I have a patient that is not really motivated, if I have a patient that is a big smoker and maybe he has also a low lip line and so never he will show the soft tissue during his social life, honestly, I, of course, I will present him both the options, but of course, always say, Honestly, in my opinion, my suggestion is to go to pink porcelain. In the other situation, in a really maybe young patient, motivated, high lip line, of course, I will try to convince the patient to do with the uh, GBR and maybe a more uh, excellent uh, uh, result. But I think that is the patient, the, the main issue, because if I don't have a motivated patient, Honestly, I'm a little bit afraid about to go with complex therapy. And another topic is the temporary. If I have the chance to create a good temporary, uh, I can really go with GBR because you know that uh, the temporary is a big issue. If you, for example, has to regenerate all the anterior teeth, all the anterior, the bone in the anterior area, and you don't have the chance to create a fixed temporary, maybe on the, the natural teeth or maybe with the good Maryland bridge, you know that to work with the mobile solution, mobile temporary solution on the graph is really dangerous because you can easily lose what you have created with the surgery. So we have many aspects, but mainly are all aspects correlated with the patients and the motivation in particular. Uh, just a question, Giacomo. Uh, do you think that there is also a relationship uh, um, on uh, the location of the, the atrophy or, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the magnitude of the atrophy? So, I mean, if there is a like a center, a single crown, uh, are you uh, thinking, uh, you can think about uh, for one single central incisor, a pink porcelain? No, never I've evaluated it. So it depends okay. also on the defect, of course. I totally okay. agree with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. 
and of course depends also on uh, the result that they can achieve. You know better than me that sometimes if you don't have good bone peaks, it's really difficult to get good result with GBR. Sometimes yeah. I have seen cases from you and also Sasha that you are forced to remove some teeth in order to get the, the good peak that you have on the neighbor tooth in order to have good regeneration. And so depends also what the result that they can achieve because if I have to do GBR and complex therapy and finalize the case with pink reconstruction, with pink porcelain, doesn't make any sense. Okay, uh, if I can add something that was really quite uh, uh, popular till some years ago, um, also um, the approach where uh, they were adding some composite in the pink uh, atrophy, okay, instead than, uh, uh, than ceramic, that is more or less uh, the option that I have. Do you have any, any comment about this, so material in that area? Now, for me, the best option is the ceramics, of course, because with composite, in particular, if you have a patient uh, with bad oral hygiene and smokers, a normally pink reconstruction is performed in this kind of patient. After one or two years, we have completely to work again on the composite that uh, can change the color, change roughness, and is really complicated. Many people like to manage the pink uh, area with composite because it's much easier. They can manage it directly in the mouth, selecting the shade guide, selecting the color, and creating directly in the mouth. And so they can see exactly what they are doing, and they can change what they are doing in order to find the ideal balance. To do it in the lab is more complicated. What I do, what my dental technician normally does in order to achieve a really good chameleontic effect is to put some really translucent, really transparent ceramics on the border on the pink porcelain. In that way, you have really a perfect blending of the light in the border, a perfect compenetration between the real subtissue and the fake one. And in that way, the result is really good. This is what we do. Mm -hmm. Okay. Much it's May I only just a question, just uh, probably can be interesting also in this area. Do you, uh, for, for, for you, Sasha, in any uh, of these cases where you plan, for example, this kind of pink porcelain, that is also my, op um, uh, my options, I mean, normally I always choose uh, zirconia or uh, ceramic. Uh, normally in these cases, do you plan to do uh, some uh, uh, osteoplastic in the way to have a, a different type of surface comparing uh, what you have in a normal GBR case, for example, or you, I mean, because also for this is a, an important topic, how to manage the crest in this area when you plan uh, pink. Good point. I think it's, um, you know, it's almost like a uh, similar situation as an edentulous arch when you're looking, for example, at, um, you know, what today is very modern, four implants or maybe six implants in an all on four fixed restoration, you have to, again, before you do the surgery, you have to plan and understand the restorative uh, contact between the gingiva, the implants, and of course the bone. So uh, for me, an osteoplasty is always like very important because I'm thinking I need to have good hygiene and of course also good uh, patients acceptance of this prosthesis for the long term. I cannot allow uh, just like a close contact with the prosthesis towards the gingiva or to the implant and have no hygiene. So for me, that's really important. So yeah, again, I would like to have a guide from let's say a good prosthodontist uh, in team or with a technician to what's the end goal in the prosthesis, which is pink. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's really important to evaluate the okay. position of the transition line, of course, also for aesthetic reason, right? I totally agree with you, Sasha. Okay. So this will be maybe a good moment to transition to um, edentulous because a lot of things we have discussed is um, you know, partially edentulous and single and all the prosthetic materials. 
Um, Giacomo, I know that, of course, also you have uh, uh, information and uh, work that you have done and patients that when you do edentulous cases. And what I'm noticing, of course, here, especially here in America, but maybe also around the world, is that the fixed restoration for mandible and maxilla, of course, is a huge uh, kind of uh, focus. And almost nobody talks anymore about overdentures. And so what is your take on this as a prosthodontist? Are you like completely, okay, I've moved my practice to fixed edentulous solutions like Olin 4, or are you still saying there is room to evaluate the patient or maybe do something like an overdenture? Yeah, yeah, it's a really another good point. Honestly, my practice, I think that when I have to treat an edentulous patient, the 90% of, of my patient receive a fixed rehabilitation. But sometimes I consider the overdenture in particular in, um, in, that, in um, patients that uh, are not so good in oral maintenance, in particular in patients that require a, um, a specific rehabilitation in order to improve and increase the lip support. Because you know that, that we, we have a rehabilitation with a, an important horizontal uh, bulk on a horizontal profile, the oral maintenance is really complicated. And so the idea to remove the prosthesis and to give to the patient the chance to clean the implant without the prosthesis on the top of them is really, really a good point. So the main aspect for me is the cleanability, the maintenance of the patient. And every single time that I have to finalize the case from the temporary to the final, always I want to be sure that the patient can clean it and maintain. If the patient cannot clean and maintain, I will consider to go in an overdenture solution. Okay, that's, that's a good point. So maybe, uh, maybe you can continue on your overdenture um, aspect because that's, of course, uh, we're talking about for this moment. Uh, when you think about the uh, frameworks that you're building to stabilize the implants, is there a difference that you maybe keep implants in a mandible uh, splinted or individual or in the maxilla splinted or individual and uh, what kind of frameworks do you put to uh, support your overdenture? When we are in the upper jaw normally I use a bar and I connect with this bar all the four see all the implants that I have that at least in the upper I want four implants because in the upper the overdenture is a, a, a prosthesis that is implant supported without any kind of, a, of a mucosa support like can happen in the lower jaw. In the lower jaw, the situation is different and we can also consider the idea to work with two implants and with locators, in particular, if you want to reduce the cost of the therapy. In this case, the rehabilitation is not implant supported because the load will be stressed not just on the implant, but also on the soft tissue. And the implants are really useful just to keep the prosthesis fixed in the mouth without any kind of uncomfortable movement. But in the upper, always at least uh, four implants and the bar that connect them. Because in the upper, it's really difficult to have uh, uh, an overdentures uh, that uh, can stress, can uh, dissipate the stress, the load also on the soft tissue. So normally I use four implants in the upper and two implants in the lower. Okay, I think that's the clear one. Um, then let's go to fixed solution for edentulous. Um, I know because you, of course, are working very much in aesthetic dentistry and, uh, you know, implant prosthodontics. Um, are you a big um, advocate of like, you know, let's say the lower cost treatments of all on four? Uh, and if you are, what do you see as problems for us that we maybe can stay away from so we can be more successful because here in America, of course, there's so many all on fours being done and <clears throat> unfortunately not always done uh, perfectly. Yeah, for, for me, it's a really good point. And uh, you know, um, for me, the main complications that we can have in case of full dental patient is normally the biomechanical complications because you know, when we don't have teeth anymore, 
we don't have periodontal ligament. So we don't have any kind of shock absorber. And from uh, the biomechanical point of view, the occlusion is really, really rigid. Normally, in case of all on four, considering, for example, a, a solution that is in acrylic, in resin, with a, a titanium bare, the most common complication that I have observed is a uh, tooth fracture or chipping. But it's a dramatic complication. Normally, what I do with my patient is that uh, I don't consider this rehabilitation like a final, mm -hmm. but I consider all this rehabilitation like long-term temporary solution. They know that something can happen because I can absolutely say they, okay, no problem in the next 10 years. It's impossible. In, particu in particular, if you work with acrylic or composite. Now, working with the monolithic zirconia or with the more complicated solution like zirconia framework with a single crown in zirconia or lithium silicate cemented on the top, the situation is different, but of course we are speaking about really, really expensive solutions. For me, the secret is don't say that all on four is a final rehabilitation. I like to call them long term temporary solution. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Francesco, you have um, something that you would like to add to this discussion? Yeah, uh, mm, I will say not uh, probably I will precise that sometimes the all on four, especially in, the, uh, in some cases of uh, important resorption, it's a, a really good, I mean, it's a really good approach when we speak about uh, implant disposition. For sure, when we speak about prosto, uh, it's true that the material play an important role. So uh, we can also consider a final restoration in a long form because we cannot do, for example, regeneration in the posterior for some reason, okay? Because the patient cannot do, but we can create a, a really nice final restoration with, for example, uh, zirconia, or then, for example, right now I'm trying to do something that it's a little different. So it's like a, a titanium bar where uh, it's uh, really uh, ideal. And then I'm going to screw over like the, uh, the zirconia, one block framework. So I have the, the titanium that is on the base and over I have something that it gives the aesthetic and the material is something biologically speaking really good. And then we, right now with the cut cam, we can play with this material in a really predictable way. So, but it's more, yeah, I agree that when we speak about cheap all on four, so it means that sometimes they, they use only acrylic, sometimes just a little metal framework in, it's something that also for me, it's not, uh, uh, not ideal for sure. And uh, every single time we use acrylic, we know from the literature, uh, as in, I can imagine Giacomo was uh, thinking about that. Uh, a nice article that was giving really impressive uh, uh, numbers uh, with uh, that 10 years uh, follow-up of these cases where only few cases were without any complication. Yeah. Few. Yeah. Papa Spiridakos, 2012. Exactly. After <laughs> yeah. 10 years, only 8.6% of patients is free of complication. Complication. It means that uh, 92 uh, yeah, 91.5 are yeah. with complications. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's interesting. A, that's a beautiful. Um, can you um, uh, put this in the chat, just the name and uh, um, the year? Yeah, the author is Papa, P Papa Spiridakos. And well, the I year. Know, I don't know how to spell that. You have to write this down. No problem. Yeah. I, will, yeah. I will find it for you. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, me too. I don't know how to to to, to write it. And, and this year is 2000, 2012. Uh, participant who can do this for us. Yeah, yeah, probably I have the article. If I can find the article, I will put in. Uh, I will send to the guy. Okay. Great. Thank you, Francesco. Say, say the name again one more time. Papa Spiridakos. It's a Greek guy. My he has a lot of paper. Papa Spiridakos. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Great, uh, great writer. Absolutely. Okay, perfect. I, I, I'll put it in the chat and then hopefully Papa Spiridakos. And 2012? Yes. 
Okay, you remember the journal? Uh, oh. Honestly, no, but we will see immediately. Okay. Francesco, you are looking for it? I, I just uh, yeah, put it in. Well. Thanks. Okay, so Papas P. Dacos 2012. I apologize uh, to our friend from Greece if there's a problem in the spelling. Okay, <laughs> so um, I think um, we can just look in the chat for a moment. I can see a, one more uh, question from uh, Boris. Um, this is again uh, a good prosthetic question. Um, and it is Do you use any reinforcement for overdentures? to prevent fractures when use, using locators or bars? No, honestly, I don't use them because I think that is not really relevant. I have tried to use uh, this kind of option, but honestly, I didn't find any kind of benefit. Okay, how about you, Francesco? Uh, sorry, I was looking the 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 article that I'm putting the if it's possible there. So the go again with the question, what was? The question is if you use any reinforcement for overdentures to uh, prevent fractures when using yeah. locators or bars. Yeah, when I use locator, I always put like a um, normally make a re reinforcement inside just in the way to prevent uh, the, the cap of the, uh, the locator. It's pushing too much in the teeth, especially if you don't have enough thickness of the acrylic. Yeah, okay. but it's just where you have the locator. Yeah. It's not yeah, a complete... Yeah. Okay, okay. Yes, in this way, yes, but it's not a, a reinforced like a bar in all the frame, like a frame. No, 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 no. it's just in, in the way like a net that is covering that area for the acrylic, especially if there is not enough thickness. Otherwise, you can see sometimes fracture of the prosthesis in yeah, that yeah, area. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, but it is just the protocol of the locator. It's not a, a, yeah, yeah, a, a, yeah. any kind of reinforcement. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So we just have here in the um, chat, um, the, I, I believe the publication. So uh, for those of you who want to copy that, it's in the chat from um, our colleague that we mentioned. So that's good. And um, at this moment, I want to um, uh, finish the conversation. So um, I think we went from um, just a short summary. We went from um, partially dentless patients, we, we saw a heavy um, agreement on zirconia frameworks that that's obviously the new, um, the new material. Uh, it's kind of taking over the world of dentistry for single teeth and for um, multiple teeth. Um, we saw that in dentless, there are still some options for traditional dentistry with overdentures and even some titanium bars with acrylic teeth, but you know, as a temporary solution. Then we saw a very interesting discussion uh, from both of you about the subgingival space, the roughening, um, of course, mainly uh, done by laboratory technician, and then still the big question of what kind of formula should we use to uh, make it biologically acceptable to place it into the um, uh, the gingival site of the implant. And uh, then we saw like a discussion that I agree as well with is that the cost custom abutments, sorry, the, the stock abutments like an on one, which also is available, available from different companies is probably a very good future um, position to take. So um, I'm very happy with this. Um, Francesco, I'm uh, really appreciative because I know it's uh, late in the evening for you and you have a family. So uh, thank you for being today our expert. Thank you. I put, I just posted the, 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 the article. Okay, just uh, the first page. Okay, so of Papa Spiridako. So who want to uh, check it's on the chat. Okay, so you can check there and then for sure find the article. Okay, thanks for uh, your calling. I mean, and uh, I have the opportunity to discuss with you, boy. Perfect. Thank Francesco. you, Francesco. Thank you. Thank you for being part of it. Uh, then from my side, it's always an, uh, a pleasure to uh, have these uh, special one-on-one -on -one interviews. I learn a lot from them. Uh, so uh, because these are kind of casual discussions. 
but like, you know, they are still like discussions which all of us need in the practice. Um, so uh, thanks to both of you. Next week, we have another expert which is coming in and it will be uh, Dr. Christian Coachman, who is of course very well known for a lot of his aesthetic work and a lot of his uh, digital smile uh, work. So uh, same, same time, same day, we'll have another one-on-one -on -one interview. So uh, we're gonna finish the, uh, the session with a video. And I wanna thank you all for uh, coming in and listening to us. Bye-bye.